Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. In those days Mary set out and went to a, with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my little womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, she sang, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. A gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. Every year on the fourth Sunday of Advent, we hear a biblical story of Mary. And this year, not only the story of her visit with Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, but we also hear Mary sing this powerful song. The opening chapters of Luke's Gospel are full of songs from Zechariah and Mary and the angels and Simeon. And right before we hear Mary's song, we hear Elizabeth declare about Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. These two women are very strong models of faith for all of us. One too old to bear a child, one so young she was not yet married, yet both were called to bear children of promise, through whom God would change the world. As Luke describes them, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. When the Word of God is spoken to them, as difficult and as challenging as that Word is, they believe it. They trust God with their whole lives, they were courageous, faithful, and bold. Mary had just received this amazing news direct from the angel Gabriel, and she responded with a servant's heart. She was chosen by God to give birth to God's own son, and she told Gabriel, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be, or may it be to me, according to your word. And later she went to the home of her relative Elizabeth, and amazingly Elizabeth recognized that Mary's child was destined to be great. And Mary responds with a song that we call the Magnificat, because that word Magnificat means to praise or to glorify God, to lift up one's voice in prayer and praise and thanks to God. And so Mary then becomes a model of faith for us. From Mary we learn about the courage to say yes, especially as we're faced with the challenges of our life. Mary said yes to God. Perhaps God chose her as the place of God's arrival through Christ on this earth because she knew that it was her habit to say yes to her Heavenly Father. And after Elizabeth's word to her, Mary breaks out in this, this song. My soul glorifies or magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God. My Savior. I think that Mary also knew the song of Zephaniah 3.17, which talks about that God is with her, that God is mighty to save, that God is going to quiet her with God's love, and that God was rejoicing over her with singing. 
And now it's Mary's turn to sing a song of praise to God. It's a song that's saturated with themes from the Old Testament. And here on this slide you see the comparison between the song of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and the song of Mary in chapter, Luke chapter 1. And as you look at the color phrases be, be, with both chapters, you see many similar phrases there. Just pause for a moment to take a look at that. It would be a good Bible study this week to take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 2 and Luke chapter 1. Mary really sings Hannah's song here. This month's cover story of National Geographic is titled, Mary, the Most Powerful Woman in the World. Another magazine a couple years ago, Christian Christianity Today, titled her, Incendiary Mary. What does that mean? Capable of starting a fire. That doesn't sound like the meek and mild Mary, humble and gentle. The author of that article, Scott McKnight, says that here in this song we discover not so much the Blessed Virgin Mary draped in piety, but the Blessed Valorous Mary dressed for action. She is indeed brave and valiant as she sings her song. The great Methodist Christian missionary to India, E. Stanley Jones, considered the Billy Graham of India, said that the Magnificat, this song, is the most radical and revolutionary document in the world. What is it about this song that E. Stanley Jones would call the most revolutionary document in the world? Or National Geographic to say she's the most powerful woman in the world? Or Christianity Today to say she's incendiary? These are not the traditional images for how we picture Mary. So, this morning, listen to the words of her song, but remember the early first century context of Herod the Great. Remember how he assassinated members of his own family for anything that even smelled of treachery. That same Herod had taxed Israel beyond its means, and surely the oppressive tax was felt more by the poor than by anyone else. And remember the Roman ruler, Caesar Augustus, who had such pride and love for himself that he called himself God and Savior. That is the historical context for Mary singing this song. For Mary's words are words of subversion, words that reveal why unjust rulers might worry when people sing these words, words that tell the first Christmas story, beginning with verse 51. That God has performed mighty deeds with his arm, that God has scattered those who are proud in the imagination of their hearts. And I, I told the pastors at the first service that every pastor has this Bible commentary said by William Barclay. And William Barclay calls this verse a moral revolution. Verse 52, God has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. And Barclay calls that a social revolution. Verse 53, God has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. And Barclay calls that an economic revolution. In that article by McKnight, he writes, These words move beyond the personal exaltation of a poor pregnant woman. They are a declaration, and you're going to love this next phrase, on the order of Luther pinning his 95 theses to the door from the voice of the bottom of society. It is a voice crying from the depths that God's Messiah was finally coming to bring justice for the poor, such as Marian and Simeon and Anna and the shepherds. It was a voice proclaiming a new order, an order centered around her son, the one who has saved his people from their sins. If you were a poor woman in that first century, if you were hungry, if you had experienced the injustices of Herod, and if you stood up in Jerusalem and sang these words, that God was going to yank down the proud, the rulers, the rich from their high and mighty places, you would likely be tried for your subversion. 
If you were Herod or one of his ten wives, you would conclude that Mary, this Mary is a rebel, a revolutionary, a social protester, and you would be right. In Kathleen Norris's book, Amazing Grace, she says the Magnificat's message is so subversive that there's a period during the 1980s the government of Guatemala banned its public recitation. Can you imagine that today? A government so fearful of a few lines from the Bible that they banned the speaking of it. It's interesting that the name Mary in the New Testament is the same name as Miriam in the Old Testament. Miriam was Moses' sister, and Miriam means rebellion. So remember that the next time you see some artwork of Mary pictured meek and mild. When we sing the Magnificat, Mary's song from Luke chapter 1, we often do that using the Hold an Evening Prayer Service, which we're going to sing after the sermon this morning. It's also in a couple other places in our hymnal. Whenever we sing Mary's song, remember that historical context. And remember Mary's faith and her boldness. In truth, Mary is a revolutionary. She's incendiary. In her song, she prophetically sings that God regards the poor, that God exalts the poor, that God feeds the poor, that God helps the poor, that God remembers the poor. It is about justice for the poor. But the song is also more than that. It announces the coming of God's kingdom that Mary's son would begin. Jesus' kingdom is not about earthly power, pride, might, riches, but about as Romans 14 describes, it's about God's righteousness. God's righteousness, it's about, Romans 14 says it's about peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Some of you who saw the movie are getting a kick out of that slide. And Scott McKnight concludes his article by saying, The Gospels come from many voices, and the one of those was Mary's. Her voice tells us what God would do through her son to subvert the injustices of Herod and the pretentiousness of Augustus. Her voice tells us that somehow, some way, someday, God would establish a kingdom of peace for the world. And Mary changed the world by surrendering to the angel Gabriel with these words, May it be, or let it be. And God used her to set loose the power of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God. This is the Mary that we need to reclaim her voice as our own. Now as Christians who happen to be Lutheran, we, do not, we don't pray to Mary, we don't worship Mary. But she is a strong a model of faith, of discipleship, as you will find in the scriptures. Mary, Mary, like us, kneels at the foot of the cross. Mary, like us, is a witness to the resurrection of our Lord. With her, let us magnify the Lord, that is, enlarge his appearance as we rejoice in God our Savior, so that the world might see God more clearly through us. With her, let's sing the revolutionary verses of her song that speak the truth of what God's kingdom is all about. It is about doing justice for all people. It's about good news for the humble and for the hungry. It's about magnifying the Lord, rejoicing in God our Savior. So with Mary, let us put our words into song and let us put our faith into action. Amen.